Good afternoon. My name is Rob Curtis. I'm the Alumni Relations Coordinator here at the Faculty of Rehabilitation Medicine at the University of Alberta. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm streaming from Corbett Hall, the home of the only freestanding rehabilitation faculty in North America. I'm pretty sure I have the entire building to myself today uh, because like most of you, we've been working at home for about a month. Uh, I've been at a makeshift desk in my spare bedroom, so I'm really looking forward to hearing our speaker's advice today. One housekeeping item before we begin. We've planned a lot of time for questions today, and the way that the Q&A will work in this live stream format is through the text chat. So everybody who's watching can type questions into the chat, and they'll only be visible to me on my screen here. With so many people watching, we anticipate a lot of questions. So I'll do some triage, and I'll pass the questions on to Dr. Miller verbally. Uh, I'll do my best to get to as many questions as possible, but please understand if we're not able to get to every question, or if I have to group a few questions together sometimes. As well, we encourage you all to use the hashtag RehabMedLive if you are live tweeting or posting any uh, work from home pictures on Instagram. The Faculty of Rehabilitation Medicine is a world leader in rehabilitation science, physical therapy, speech language pathology, and occupational therapy. Our researchers, faculty, students, and alumni are enhancing lives through rehabilitation throughout the world. We've created this new live stream series, Rehab Med Live, so that we can make their expertise available to you as a resource at a time when it's needed more than ever. The first president of our university, Henry Marshall Torrey, famously said that knowledge must not be the concern of scholars alone. The uplifting of the whole people shall be our final goal. Our speaker today embodies that vision. Dr. Linda Miller is an alumna of the Faculty of Rehabilitation Medicine, as well as a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy and a member of the Dean's Advisory Council. Dr. Miller is a leading expert in the field of ergonomics and president of ergonomics firm EWI Works. And despite a very busy schedule, when I first asked her if she would give this presentation today, she agreed immediately, and she told me that she really wanted to do this as a way to give back and assist. We're so proud to have Dr. Miller as part of our alumni community, and we're very grateful to her for sharing her expertise with us, us this afternoon. Dr. Miller, welcome, and I'll pass the floor to you and then start to see if there's ways to better improve our overall office setup when we're starting to look at how we're gonna carry forward in a healthy and successful, successful way. The other thing that I also wanna be able to do is just talk on some additional considerations to think about when you're working at home and keep reinforcing the importance of movement and also staying socially connected. I know we need to be physically distancing right now, but I think the staying socially connected is extremely important. I'm actually a member of the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce and not, not too long ago, they actually sent out a survey to all their members asking how many of the employers were actually intending to have people working or were currently having people work temporarily from home. And of those members, 70% actually said they had people working temporarily at home. And that's quite a significant number when you look at that community. We couldn't find national numbers. We wanted to see what we were looking at from a national perspective, but we did find some US numbers that we're looking at. Um, about 80, just over 88% of the organizations were encouraging people or requiring people to work from home. And when they actually talked to chief financial officers, they actually had talked about potentially even um, permanently shifting employees to remote work after COVID-19. So it's something that's of interest for us to kind of monitor because some of this might be temporary, but this might be even a new way of work in the future. So it's hard to say where we're gonna go from here. I thought this was kind of a neat little um, set of pictures because often when we think about working from home, we have these beautiful ideas that we're gonna have this lovely space and it's gonna be very well lit and everything's gonna be organized and it's gonna be something that is gonna be very attractive to actually move into that space and will be very productive. Some of the pictures that we're seeing though are quite different. We have spaces that are actually shared with kids and a lot of them are trying to do their homework at the same time where we have another partner or spouse that's trying to also remotely work. I also have people that have talked to me also that they've had to relocate into spaces even in the basement. So they may not have the most optimal furniture, it might be cooler space, it may not have a lot of light. And sometimes, and it looks maybe a little bit ridiculous here, but 
people are trying to find any space that might be even remotely quiet in order to actually participate in some of their online meetings or even communicate back and forth. So they might find a stairwell or they might find a place in a bedroom. So they're really trying to be inventive of where they're gonna actually set up, but that actually starts to impact how we're actually performing our work activities. So I think what the reality of the situation right now is that work from home is, is temporary, but I think we really don't know for how long. I actually was just listening to the Prime Minister this morning. He said it could be months before people are transitioning back. So that's a very interesting thing for us as ergonomists to think about and occupational therapists is that it can actually impact how people perform their work and how safe they are when they're actually performing it as well. The other thing that's very evident, and I talked to a lot of workers already, and I asked them, so what were some of the things that you were sent home with? And the most common things, and I think because we thought it was gonna maybe be for days or weeks, is they were sent home with a cell phone and a laptop. So we often don't have our normal equipment like an adjustable chair. We may not be working with a full screen monitor or dual monitors. There's a lot less equipment than we normally find in our, our office environments. The other thing that we have also been able to hear from a number of people is that they don't have a dedicated space. They often would work maybe an hour off and on at home in the evening, but because they have children or they may have um, a smaller space, they haven't got the luxury. And I think that's a lot of students. I think of my own kids who are in university right now and they don't necessarily have a dedicated space that can be actually used as a home office as well. And I, I think the interesting thing, again, is that we do have a lot of extra people in our home that typically during the day, kids would have been off to school or our partner would have been off to work. But now we have everybody actually in the home environment. And so that's creating demands for computer space, for Wi-Fi wi as well. So there's some interesting challenges that we're starting to look at. So people always tell me, okay, Linda, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna start to have to think about if we wanna stay comfortable? Because the first couple of days, it wasn't too bad, but now we're starting to have more and more people contact us and say, you know, I'm get, I have really bad upper back discomfort, neck discomfort, even lower back discomfort. And so what should I be starting to think about doing? And where should I even be thinking about sitting? So I, I think people will be surprised for me to say that there's not one perf perfect posture. There'll be times that you might wanna sit on the couch. There might be times that you're gonna actually have the opportunity to sit in a chair. And sometimes you might even wanna actually stand. So having the ability to actually support your posture in these variety of different um, positions is what's the most critical thing for us to think about. And when we're setting up for what site, a slight recline position or a sitting position or even a standing position, we always want to think that we want to have our hands so that they're about elbow height when we're using the keyboard and the mouse. And we want to make sure that we're not hunching the shoulders or having to lean forward in order to do that. So we really want to consider our elbow height when we're starting to look at either sitting or standing. And I always think that if you're trying to think about that in terms of how it might look, and not all of us are gonna have a height adjustable chair, but even just sit in a chair and take your sitting elbow height when you're in an upright position, and that would be from the floor to the base of the elbow, and that's gonna give you your working height for your sitting height. And then for your standing height, you would just do that in a standing posture from the floor to the base of the elbow as well. Now, what makes this kind of interesting, especially for sitting, is most of us have, um, I, actually, I, th I think the majority of people I've talked to, they don't have a dedicated desk that might match that. And for instance, I'm five foot five on a good day, but I'm gonna take five foot five. And if I was to take my actual sitting elbow height, it's about 25.5 inches. I'm sorry, I'm still old fashioned. I work in Imperial and metric, but um, it's about 25.5. And if we would move to a dining room table, the actual working height or that height is usually between the heights of about 29 to 30 inches. So even though I can have my seat seated at elbow height, I'm probably going to have to actually raise that chair in order to compensate for that because of the fact that the desk, the surface is about four and a half or five inches higher 
in order to actually compensate for that. So that leads to some other concerns that I have to think about as I start to move forward. So when we're starting to look at seat at position, and like I said, we're really often asking the question, can I find a stable surface that I can put, um, position my laptop, my keyboard, my mouse, if I have that as an option? And that might require me to use a standard kitchen chair. Some of us might have the luxury of having an adjustable chair, but if we don't, that might actually require us to actually see if there's a pillow that we can sit on, something that's firm that would actually help us to raise ourselves to a better height. And if you're like me, um, my feet dangle from that chair when I'm actually raised, I'm going to have to look at something to support my feet. And so that's very critical that if I'm going to be sitting and I have to raise where I'm seated because of using a, a pillow or some type of cushion or even adjusting the chair higher, I'm not going to want to have my feet dangling from the chair because that can create a lot of discomfort into the legs, the lower back, and even swelling into the feet as well. The other thing that I always tell people to think about is if you're going to be looking at sitting for a period of time, you want to have some support for your lower back. And I always say that to find your lower back area, just find the belt line on your pants typically, and that's usually where about the lumbar area or the lower back is located. And you want to have support so that you're, you're actually able to maintain those natural curves of the lower back and the upper part of the back and neck. And that might come in the form of finding a little bit firmer pillow, or I have a lot of people will actually take a towel and roll it up and use masking tape just so it stays firm. And they position it into that lower back area just to give themselves a little bit extra support. When we're moving to actually starting to look at how do we maintain those upper parts of the back and also the neck, we wanna start thinking about where we're actually viewing. And as you can see in this first image, a laptop's great. Um, it gives us a lot of convenience. It allows us to be very mobile. It allows us to actually um, have something very lightweight, but it's not really designed for long periods of use. And as you can see in this particular image in the, on the left, you can actually see you're looking down. And that's because the viewing area and the input devices are actually connected. So it naturally creates that forward bent posture of the upper back and neck. So I always say that there's a couple of ways that we can actually uh, tackle this if we don't have an independent monitor that we can plug into. One, we can actually find something to just slightly angle it and it just improves that viewing angle. We might want to tilt it back a little bit as you see in the middle picture. Or even better, if we can find an independent keyboard or mouse, just see if there's something that you can actually raise that whole laptop up and it will actually position at a better um, viewing posture. Now, if I don't have bifocals, I ideally would like to have it the top of the screen just about eye level or just slightly below. But if you have um, bifocals, you want it actually a little bit lower because you're viewing through the, under, the lower portion of your glasses. So it's really important to really look at posture. And if you have somebody in your home environment, just see if you're actually, get them to have a look at you and see if you're facing forward and you're not tilted down when you actually have that um, monitor position. So I, I think there's lots of ways for us to move through when we're seated to actually try to tap a good sitting elbow height and then also making sure we're supported, but also look at where we're positioning things comfortably for viewing as well. The other thing is that people always talk to me about is standing the new sitting, or, or sorry, it's not standing the new sitting, it's standing the new smoking. Um, I don't agree that uh, standing is the new smoking. I think the lack of activity and having very seven, sedentary life, lifestyles is the concern. But what I really do encourage us when we're at home or even if we have those options, try to see if you can actually see periodically if you can move into a standing posture. And a lot of us have raised islands or we have even a, a little bit of a kitchen uh, ledge that's about elbow height. Again, try to get it at the proper height for your, your hands in terms of the input devices. But then again, if you can separate the monitor and just raise it up on something that's going to put out a little bit of better viewing posture, it's again going to allow you to maintain those very upright postures. So. Those are some very simple things that can be used in order to optimize a standing posture. 
Now, one of the things that I think is kind of interesting as I've looked around, um, even for my own staff, we've talked a lot about if we have space, or are there alternative spaces to work? And there's lots of people vying for those spaces in order to get their schoolwork done, or they might have to be remotely working, or even just keeping connected with others, other individuals socially. So one of the things that we've actually started to encourage people to um, talk about at home is what's your schedule? See if there's a way that you can book time in a space that's dedicated, that's going to be comfortable, that you're not going to have to assume really awkward postures. And I really encourage people to talk with their families, their partners. Is there a way that you can find a good, good space in the household, but also give time that people can work comfortably and effectively in those spaces as well? So sometimes those scheduling activities become important as well. The final thing that I wanted to also highlight um, just uh, around workstation setup is that we really want to think about if we've got proper working heights, we've got good viewing heights, we want to also think about how things are placed. And the primary items that we'll typically have will be a keyboard and a mouse. Those will be the things that we most frequently use. And if possible, you want to keep them in what we call that primary zone. And that's where if you have your elbow bent at 90 degrees and you make a radius around you, your keyboard and mouse should actually be positioned that close at the same height and close to the body. So it's really important to still keep in, in mind that you don't want to overreach to frequently used items and you want to make sure they're at the same height if you're going to be using any type of input devices as well. The other um, thing to consider, not all of us are going to be required to talk on the phone, but I, I know even in my own company, we regularly run remote meetings. So if there's any way that you can be using a speaker, you can actually use a set of headphones or ear, um, uh, even a headset. I would really encourage that rather than actually cradling the, sh the telephone between the ear or the shoulder. I've actually had a lot of people with cell phones where they're actually holding the cell phone and they're trying to talk and still take notes. Um, it's interesting that they're starting to experience elbow issues as well. So it's really important to see if you have to spend any time on the phone or you're communicating with others, try to keep it hands-free as much as possible. Then um, another thing that I um, also kind of uh, recommend for people is to think about the fact that we do have lots of distractions out there. And um, there's lots of people sharing our space and it's not what we expected. Um, and we're trying to actually still be good at work, good at school. So if you can think about the fact that um, if there's a chance to actually minimize some of those distractions, like I said, possibly scheduling a space or even making a dedicated space in your home, I think some of those things will help um, reduce some of those distractions. I've had a number of people also ask me, Linda, do you think we can be as productive at home? And I, I really do believe we can be very productive, but it may not be right now. Um, I think there's a lot of people out there that have a lot of challenges with not the uncertainty of jobs, the uncertainty of how work is going to look, the fact that we've had this massive change very quickly where everybody in a family or a co-living environment are now working in the home environment. So I think we've got to be a bit um, um, good, for, good to ourselves and be able to talk to our employers and, and really talk about how do we make this work so it's still successful for the person working from home and it is for the employer as well. So the last thing that I kind of want to go over is the importance of movement. And in the office environment, we used to typically recommend that people would get up anywhere from 50, every 50 to 60 minutes and go for a short walk or change their posture. And we had that ability, and it was a lot, it sometimes is a little bit easier. People say, well, why, why is that easier in an office environment? Well, when we actually talk to remote workers, it's very common that they can get focus very quickly and they often forget to take breaks. So now what we're really encouraging people to do is see if you can try to get up every 20 to 30 minutes, either change your posture from working to sitting into a standing posture. If you're on a call, maybe take and walk while you're on the call. 
but just really try to remember to take those breaks. They're absolutely criti critical to get up and move around. And um, some of the simple things that we've done is just set a timer on the phone. I have other people that have set an actual timer, egg timer, because they tend to bypass things on their phone. There's lots of little tricks to, to help us um, remember to actually get up and move. I wanted to also reinforce the importance of staying active through this whole time. I know a lot of us have to be restricted in terms, of obviously, for physical distancing, but there's some great uh, resources out there that I'd like to kind of bring your attention to. They are free. The one that I, I really like, and there's lots of little videos, there's lots of things that are suggested for home, is participation. And another one that I've, re I've started following that's excellent is the Center for Active Living. They have come up with some great videos, great suggestions as well. So there's some really good free resources. And you, as many of you probably already know, there's lots of other videos and um, different apps out there to encourage movement. But I, I believe active movement is going to be critical to help get us through this time. I also want to just highlight, we have a number of resources that are free as well. And um, we have an on, we actually have an app on the Apple Store and the Google Play Store that you can actually download. It can go through some very basic questions and suggestions. So those, there's lots of resources out there that I recommend you go out and have a look, look at so you can start going through and trying to set up your own workspace as well. Well, we're coming to the end of my section of the presentation, and um, hopefully it was okay that you didn't get too, too bored of listening to me. But um, before I hand it back over to Rob, I'm going to ask also, for those of you that can, I am a very big proponent of the University of Alberta, and specifically to the, the wonderful faculty and students that are out there. And if you have the means, I would really encourage you to um, donate to the University of Alberta Food Bank. I know that there's been some tremendous change for students out there, and I, I really hope that we can support our students as they're going through a lot of change right now. So I'm just going to start, stop, I'm going to stop my sh screen sharing and turn it back over to Rob. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. Um, that was great. And in the chat, uh, I'm seeing a lot of other people that are saying thank you. And a couple of other people have said that they uh, have been inspired to stand up and move and to uh, change their workspace a little bit already as a result of the advice that they've heard. So thank you. Um, so uh, everybody, please feel free to type some questions into the chat and we'll get to as many of them as we can. I have a few here already. Uh, I have one here from, uh, uh, this is from uh, Laurie and Lindsay. They both ask if you have any recommendations for children since uh, so many kids now are doing their schoolwork at home in similar situations. Is it similar kind of advice or anything different for kids? Do you know, um, we, I, I think there's some very basic principles that um, as we apply it from adults into kids can be very effective, but I'm also going to highlight that I have found a number of great resources by other occupational therapists and physical therapists. And I, if it's possible, I'd like to actually link that through to the U of A because they, they have a lot of great tips for kids and proper setup. The biggest thing that I I think if you can reinforce is getting kids to actually move around, change their posture making sure that they're, you know, staying active throughout the day. Kids are fairly resilient, and but they really do need to move. And um, I think the basic principles of setting up the proper positioning and making sure they're actually supported are still the same as an adult. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we've had uh, also a couple of questions um, just to mention as well um, <laughs> that we are looking at making and uh, yes, we do share our workspace with little ones sometimes, don't we? Yeah, I know it. <laughs> and so uh, we've had a couple questions as well about potentially making uh, this pre presentation available as a recording, and we do plan on doing that, just to let everybody know. Uh, that will go up on our website um, very soon. You can check our website, rehabilitation.ualberta.ca, for some more details. Uh, another question we've had, uh, we've had several actually around lighting. Do you have any suggestions? People are having problems with glare um, or with tired eyes, that sort of thing. 
That's a great question because a lot of times when, um, actually let me just take a step back. So the most frequently reported form of discomfort in an office environment is actually eye strain. And if I was to survey people at any one time, I usually see reports anywhere between about 70 to 80% of the time. So I always think if we can use the same principles as what we're actually using in the office environment and start to actually think about where we're setting the computer, it's really important. So if I'm actually positioned and I'm facing an uncovered window, that ambient light is really hard in the eyes where I'm viewing that under, uncovered window, but I also have to view the screen at the same time. So ideally, it's really important not to position looking out to, into that beautiful space, but it's better to be actually where you have a window to the side of the screen itself. And the other thing that's really important, there'll be peak times of the day where light and glare is very high. So you may actually have to pull the drapes or pull um, your blinds just for a short period of time to reduce some of that discomfort. And you know how we had talked about encouraging movement every 20 to 30 minutes? Uh, I work with a couple of optometrists and they've continued to reinforce the importance to actually um, look periodically away from the screen. So making sure that every 20 minutes you're looking away at a distance of about 20 feet and just periodically get up walk away from the screen and actually expose yourself to some natural daylight. I think it's really important that you have a combination of things to actually tackle it. And we had a follow-up question about lighting as well. Do you have any guidance on lighting temperature, warm lighting or cool lighting or that sort of thing, or is it sort of personal preference? Um, well, some of the evidence right now points to more of a warmer light and it's not as harsh on the eyes. So um, I know a lot of people have put LEDs into their homes and they've gone with the cooler light um, in terms of it looking more like natural daylight. That's actually quite hard on the eyes. And so I've actually encouraged people to go with a, um, a warmer light. It's easier on the eyes. And that's the same for if you have a task light, is the, that warmer light is easier on the eyes as well. Uh, and we've had a couple of people uh, mention as well that they are experiencing uh, some stiffness in their back and those aches and pains and that sort of thing. Do you have any recommendations for uh, any, uh, you know, exercises or stretches they can do or any resources that you can point them towards for that? Well, I can certainly, um, we can certainly share a bunch of resources online with you as well and with um, people that have attended. But I think the biggest one, and I keep always reinforcing this with people is, get up and move and it, whenever possible try to go through a full range of motion when you're actually um, getting up in the morning be very gentle with the body don't do really extreme motions but it's really important to stay active the other thing i uh, caution people as well is at the very beginning it was kind of fun to sit on that comfy couch and kind of work with your, your legs crossed with the laptop i know um i did that a couple times which was not smart because they had trouble getting out of the, the chair after. But um, if we're in these really very non-firm chairs, it actually creates really awkward posture. So I often talk about the shape of the spine. If we end up in more of a C shape of a spine, it actually puts a lot of stress on the discs, the ligaments, the lower back muscles. So what we're trying to do is really promote those natural curves of the back. And when we sit in a, like an overstuffed chair that doesn't have a lot of support, it's very hard to maintain those postures. And I'm seeing a lot of questions come in about seating. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of summarize and group some of them together. Um, uh, how do you feel about things, for example, like uh, sitting on an exercise ball? Well, I've never been a proponent of the exercise ball and, um, you know, they're fine for gym. I can honestly tell you I do my own exercises and they're valuable in a gym space where I have proper footwear and I have proper clothing in terms of the friction against the ball itself. The biggest disadvantage with the ball is that a lot of times people don't have it to the size it needs to be in order to actually get to that proper sitting elbow height. So just recently I had a friend in Phoenix and we were talking about, she said she uses a ball and she says, I wasn't even paying attention and it was already deflating. And here I was sitting where my elbows were much lower 
than my hands and wrists that created, you know, some fairly awkward postures for the forearms. But more importantly, what she's starting to find, she was actually splaying the elbows and shrugging the shoulders, and it was really contributing to upper back and neck discomfort. So it, I, I'm very mixed about the exercise balls. And some people have asked as well uh, about the idea of bringing in, uh, you know, a traditional office type chair, um, you know, possibly renting one or that sort of thing. Is that something that you see people doing a lot? Do you think that's something that's necessary? Uh, do you have a, a stance on that? Well, it's a very, I like, I, what a fantastic question because I think right now what we're really trying to do as ergonomists is first get people to look at their what they have in their home because we don't know what how long people are going to be home and if they end up purchasing a lot of stuff, we still have to pay for it. So I often think about the length of time we might be at home. Ideally, if we start getting farther out and we know that we're going to have to be working remotely for a period of time, yeah, I think at that point we should start looking at having a good adjustable chair. And there's lots of great chairs out there that you can still keep it within an acceptable budget. And I do know that there are employers that are now deploying some of their furniture home with staff and they've deployed home a, ch a chair or even a monitor, but it's getting creative. I think that's the key is that we start looking at creative solutions as well, but a great question. And I've got one more about seating as well. Um, several people are asking different scenarios where they're sharing a chair with somebody. So it could be a, a traditional office type chair that is really designed for one of them and the other person perhaps is much smaller. Uh, and so for example, one person was talking about the armrests being out too wide. Um, other people are asking about crossing their legs in the chair. Um, is that sort of chair still a good starting point or should, should people be looking at having two different chairs instead of sharing? Um, any advice on that? Well, you know, I, I, I think I'm kind of a minimalist in a sense that I, th I would like to first see what you can do with your existing chair. So if the chair is too big and it's like, let's say it fits well for one person, but the other person, they're a bit smaller and maybe not as tall in terms of stature, start by looking at seeing if you can use pillows on the side to actually prop up close to the armrests um, so that it brings in a little bit more support for that person that may be smaller in width. If it's an issue around um, height, if the seat pan is too long, and I always tell people to, a guidance for seat pan length is that you should be able to actually fit between two to three finger widths between the edge of the seat pan and the back of the knee. And that's going to tell me if I have fairly good coverage. If it's too long and it's going into the back of the knee, that's where people will start getting tingling and numbness. So again, you could take a pillow and just kind of help push you forward a bit in the chair. Uh, so we've had a number of people share in the chat as well um, some things that they've found useful. So I've just kind of collected a, some, yeah, these and some notes um, yeah. and maybe just if you have some reaction to them. Um, so blue filter glasses were mentioned for looking at the computer screen, uh, sad lamps um, if you don't have access to natural light, uh, and yeah. someone else was mentioning yoga as a, a good tool to stay active uh, during the day. Well, just to pick up on the yoga side of it, um, the Produce Action has even some videos that are great, just reinforcing very gentle yoga. And I, I practice myself. I think it's an awesome way to actually keep the body moving and still um, very, you know, keeping good range of motion. In terms of the satellites, my biggest thing about the satellites, I like them as well. They're kind of a, they're they're a good tool, but there is evidence that if you have them on all day or even more than a, a couple of hours, or even an hour in some cases I, I've recently read, is that you can actually start shifting your circadian rhythm. And that's another big thing that we're hearing right now from a lot of people is that they're having trouble sleeping. And I hope you don't mind me going off on a tangent here right now, but a lot of times we're not able to actually designate a space that's separate for our work activities or schooling activities. And so we're in our bedroom. And we've got the desktop there, we've got our cell phones there, and then those things are all ready if we don't turn them off or put them into do not disturb at night. They can really affect our sleep patterns. As for the blue filter um, lenses, I've had a lot of people come back and say they can be very effective. 
And so it's something that you may want to actually talk with your optometrist with because there can be effective. Other people have said they've had mixed results, but I've heard some very good things as well. We've had a number of uh, really interesting comments and questions on the topic of uh, sharing this information with other people and educating others. Uh, and so just to kind of group those together, um, we've had some questions about if you know of any resources for kids, uh, you know, an online resource to help show them some of these ideas. Um, people were also talking about uh, as supervisors, if they can share this information, uh, how to do it safely, how to share this information safely with the people that they work with, um, because that person is not an occupational therapist themselves. Uh, and then uh, also uh, the issue of communicating with uh, one's employer um, and communicating these needs to them, if there's any resources or advice you have for communicating with all these different groups of people that we're working with. Again, fantastic um, questions. So I want to take each one separately. I, I would like to work with the University of Alberta to help see if we can put some resources together and more so not necessarily from our from us because that's not our expertise with kids. But I do know that there are some fantastic private practice OTs that are out there in PTs and even work with the U of A staff in terms of rehab staff just to see if there's things that we can make available online, um, potentially through after this webinar. With regards to supervisors talking with their frontline employees, um, there's lots of good information out there. One thing that I'm going to highlight for um, people that's something that's going to be considered local at some point, um, we're right now working with HS, and it's um, we wanted to do something back for Alberta Health Services, and that's to help with their workers as well that are working remote. So we're going to be actually putting an online um, video together and again it will be um, it's not available yet but it will be actually released to the AHS uh, YouTube channel as well so that might be something simple that can be used and communicated. The other one I wanted to highlight as well is occupational health and safety um, through the government is putting through together some good resources as well and they recently hired two uh, ergonomists that are I, I know them very well and they're fantastic. So I think if we can look at multiple resources and go to very credible resources, that's um, what's really important is that it's um, not the flavor of the day or trying to get some nifty piece of equipment. We really want to use good fundamental principles for safe setup. And then the last one about communicating. Um, one of the things that we always try to encourage when we work with employers and um, we're working with a couple of safety associations right now is the importance of early reporting. And so if you are struggling in terms of having discomfort or you're having some issues with trying to get set up, the first step is to literally talk to your supervisor and your employer. And they, I think they'll surprise a lot of people in terms of trying to come up with creative ways. One of the things that I've seen in the province and I'm super proud of being an Albertan and um, I love the fact of how people are coming together and really trying to work together to come to good solid solutions. So I would start by first asking and communicating your concern. Thank you very much and that's uh, that's definitely a conversation that uh, you and I'll be having about some of these resources we can uh, join forces on <laughs> and uh, and we'll post those uh, to our website you can also follow us on social media just to give you that website again our website is rehabilitation.ualberta.ca and so check that in the coming days uh, once we've sort of curated some of these resources we'll make them available there for you to take a look at um, here's a quick one that I've needed to get to for a little while uh, lots of us have keyboards with those little tabs on the back of them to make the keyboard angled. Oh, yes. And the question is yay or nay? Nay. I would prefer you not actually use them. The only time I've actually encouraged people to use the little tabs on the back, if you have somebody that's never been trained how to actually type and they have to watch their fingers in terms of keying, then that kind of reduces some of that forward leaning position. But if you can keep it flat, it's better to keep a flat position to encourage a straighter position for the wrist. Uh, and here's a quick follow up on the blue filter glasses questions. Uh, do you know if those are safe for kids to use? 
I don't know. And that's a great question. Um, again, I, I think it would be best to, to default to an optometrist. And a lot of the vision work we do right now, we work with ophthalmologists and optometrists because that's really their area of expertise. So I think I would talk to an optometrist or an ophthalmologist about it. And in the chat, Michaela is saying that she immediately leveled her keyboard. So thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's good advice. Um, all right, and uh, there's a question here uh, in one of the, on one of the slides. Uh, you were talking about the primary area and the secondary area uh, when you check your the radius of your arms. Um, we have a question if you can expand on that a little bit when we're working with multiple devices. We might have a, a laptop and a phone and pen and paper. And do you have any suggestions for that kind of a, a work setup? That is such a good question because um, you know it's interesting. I was thinking even just in the last two years um, when we've gone out to do assessments, the number of people that are working with multiple monitors. So right now when they're sitting at home, they often will have either an iPad uh, additionally to, with their setup or they might have uh, a laptop and their main, main computer screen. So the couple things that I always say that if you have to be writing or you have to be actually inputting those devices or those things like a pen, a piece of paper, if that's something you're commonly doing, that should be in your primary zone. If you're primarily only using a keyboard and a mouse, that should be in your primary zone. And I often will have people just look down, like look at their actual workstation itself. And if you see your coffee cup in your primary zone, you might want to question maybe that can go in the secondary zone. But try to keep that primary zone clear of anything that you're not using on a regular basis. It's something that you want to reduce re reaching. If it's going to be something very occasional that you're going to have to do, like you're going to turn on and off, you might want to have that in the primary, the secondary zone. And what we define as the secondary zone is when the arm is fully extended. That's the end of the secondary zone. So primary zone for those things that are really frequently used. And that would be your keyboard, your mouse, it might be a pen and paper. If you're actually using the iPad regularly to key on it, well, of course, you'd actually want to have that in your primary zone. But I want to challenge you with iPads. It's um, with iPads, again, you have it like a laptop. You're integrating the input device with the, the actual screen itself. So if you can, you may want to actually look at an independent surface to be connecting with the iPad so you're not so you can actually prop the iPad at more of an angle. I hope that answers the question. Uh, we've had a, a number of questions as well about sleep. Um, as you mentioned earlier, um, now is a time when a lot of people can be finding it difficult to sleep. And we've had some questions about, uh, are there any exercises um, that would be appropriate? Any other um, resources or tools that, uh, that you'd recommend? Um, I'm going to talk about some of the ones that we commonly recommend, but um, I'm also going to default to the University of Alberta because we have Dr. Carrie Brown actually out of the, the rehab medicine faculty, and she's world renowned for some of her work as well. So again, um, great resources out of the U of A. Some of the very simple things that I recommend for people to do, if you can go back to old standard alarm clock um, and get your um, imp like your your smartphone or iPad out of the room, I, they actually suggest if you can start winding down at least an hour before bed, and that's from an iPad or your, um, your smartphone, I think it's really important. The other thing that I try to encourage people to do is if you can get a regular routine. So you start preparing the body for sleep, you may have a shower or a bath, you wanna make sure that your area is, is nice, tidy, where you can actually feel like you're getting prepped for sleep and really keep the room for sleep and not be doing office work or trying to um, do other activities outside of what we normally do in a bedroom. So, uh, And a follow-up question on that. Um, any, are there any thoughts about, you know, mattresses or sleeping environment or anything like that? Um, like, the, like the actual bed setup itself, or is that sort of a personal preference thing as well? Um, well, one of the things, and it's not, I, I'd never recommend you go out and buy a brand new mattress now, but um, sometimes we haven't necessarily been replacing the mattresses. Like a lot of times um, we're talking that sometimes a mattress has a, about a life of about 10 years. 
And so they can be not the most supportive either. There is some personal pre preference that comes into play in terms of your overall comfort. But I would start by looking at the temperature of the room. We often want to have it a little bit cooler. We don't want to have it really warm. If you can, um, make sure that you have good supportive, uh, you know, you have, you have a nice area that you feel like you're comfortable in that environment. And the other one that I know I had challenges with when I was certainly younger is having kids sleep in the bed. Um, it is challenging if you have other, like your children or you have a pet, it can actually affect your sleep patterns as well. Uh, and we've had a question now, uh, this is an interesting one from Stanley. So he's, um, he's noticed that his right hand, which he used to control the mouse, is getting tired over the course of the day and also his neck and shoulder. Uh, so he's suspecting that that could be a monitor height issue. Um, he's wondering also if it might be a chair height issue and wondering if from that information, um, if you have any recommendations for that situation or if you need a little more info. Um, well, uh, it probably helpful to actually see a picture if he can actually even send it in. But one thing I would like to comment you know, we're often encouraged now to learn new things. And I, one of the things that we often will recommend is if somebody's having a bit discomfort using the mouse, obviously we want to look at chair height and we want to look at the position of the um, actual input device. But you may even want to start learning to actually use the mouse with the opposite hand. So you can actually break up how much time is used, the mouse is used with either hand. And it's challenging. I am terrible at it, but I know there's other people that have been very successful to make it um, make that change. One quick thing though is when you try to actually move to the left left hand side or the opposite side, you will have to ch change the the clicker so that it's to the to the left hand or to the right hand. So you just go in and actually change that with the pointer device. Uh, and another quick question here. Um, the question is about. Uh, bringing work computers home, is that something that uh, is worth the trouble of going in and, and bringing it home again? Um, have you seen people doing that? Any comments on that? I haven't really heard about people bringing um, work computers home. A lot of them will have a laptop that they may have, that's a work laptop. What more I've been hearing is some organizations are letting people take their monitor home. So that's what I've been hearing more so. Uh, and here's another quick one. Uh, is it safe to sit with crossed legs for long periods of time? I wouldn't encourage it, to be honest. It's, um, first of all, it's a very awkward posture for the knees, but it also it's not the best for the pelvis because we're actually sitting where we're not level. And um, for a short period of time, I would say it's not a problem. But if that's the primary posture, you're really creating um, an unequal position for the hips and you're impacting the lower back as well. Uh, and we've had some people typing in some, uh, some resources that they've found as well. So just to uh, mention a couple of those quickly, uh, one person was talking about connecting their uh, computer to their television with an HDMI cable to act as a oh, second cool. monitor, which yeah. seems like an interesting idea. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, a number of people are pointing out uh, that there are various applications available as well that help you adjust um, the color balance on your screen. Uh, and uh, people are talking about plugging second keyboards into a laptop as well and um, yes. wondering how easy that is and that that is very easy uh, yeah. to do so that's something that people are recommending and there are a number of people that are really strongly advocating for coffee too I must say uh, <laughs> as, a, as a useful tool <laughs> uh, let's see um, we are starting to run a little bit low on uh, the questions let me get to a couple more here um, Oh, uh, yeah, here's an interesting one. Um, and a couple of these kind of go together. So the question is about uh, using voice recognition on the computer as opposed to typing on the keyboard. I think that maybe sort of ties into a question we had about any resources that are out there um, for people with, um, uh, with disabilities, uh, whether it's a, a, a visual disability or, or that sort of thing. So I know with um, uh, Apple computers, there's lots of accessibility um, that is built into the computers themselves. I'm not a tech wizard. I had to learn the hard way on most things, but I do know that there's some excellent applications that are built into a lot of computers already. 
big thing that I would um, just kind of query, not so much query, but warn um, people to be aware of is that when we move to total voice recognition, it takes time to learn and people become very deliberate with how they talk. And that can be really hard on the vocal cords. And as you can even see this hour that I've been talking, I've had to drink quite a bit of water. And I, I always tell people, you know, if you're gonna go to voice recognition, realize that you're gonna have to drink a lot more water. You're gonna have to make sure you're regularly taking breaks. You will not get 100% away from a keyboard and mouse. And then the other thing that's really important, and this question came up at the very beginning of the session today, is around eye strain. And we often see eye strain actually increase when people are using voice recognition. So it's to just balance it. Uh, an interesting one just came in, a question about holding a cell phone. Um, so <laughs> I happen to have mine here. Often we're having to hold a phone in order to video conference. Um, yeah. and that sort of thing, or we may be texting a lot more to keep in contact with coworkers. Uh, do you have any advice or resources about how to do that in a healthy way? Well, one of the things, if you're gonna do video conferencing, if there's any way that you can actually prop it against something so that it's actually angled and then not hold on to it, because the hand's not really suited to just be holding on to something, it fatigues very quickly. So if you can actually set it against a wall or you can set it against, um, say, even this, another item that's in your um, environment, and you can actually then do the video conference that way, it's going to take some of that loading off the hand. The texting, I really encourage people to keep in mind that the phones were not designed for long narratives. So those things that are quick, you know, responses back and forth, yeah, text, that's, that's not a problem. But if you really do need to actually have a longer conversation or communication, I would default to your email. Uh, and we've got time to fit just a few more quick ones in here. Um, do you have a recommendation for how long the break should be when you're getting up every, every so often to, to move and stay active? You know, it depends on the person. So that's what's really um, interesting. Some people, uh, they just need a minute to two minutes to just take a quick walk around their environment. Other people need a little bit longer to stretch the back or change their full posture. But I would say anywhere from, say, two minutes right up to about five minutes. Uh, do you have any th thoughts on using a trackpad as opposed to a mouse? Um, a trackpad can be good. I always recommend um, that if it's integrated into the laptop, what you're now doing is you're kind of coming in with the arms very close and they cross the body. And that's actually considered an awkward posture. And you'll actually start to have people complain of wrist problems. They can often have issues with the elbow and the shoulders. So for short duration use, it's okay. Um, if you have a trackpad that can be actually positioned like a mouse off to the side, that might be a little bit better. And then we had a question about uh, finger pain and pain in the joints of the hands after typing for a long time. Is that something that could be related to a postural issue? Yep, yeah, it can be. Um, I think uh, it often can be a position related to the position of the wrists or the position of the fingers. The other thing is I would really um, get people to think about how much stress they're carrying right now. I know that I've carried a lot of stress, my own staff have, and it's not just related to work, but it's all the changes that are taking place right now. So I think it's not just how we're set up, but it's also our body's response to stress as well. So taking time to relax is important. And we've just got a couple minutes left here. Um, I thought uh, there's a few questions here I could kind of group together as, as a good way to close out. Uh, there have been a number of comments about how the environment that we're working in is so different, as you just said. Uh, and we've had, for example, people saying, um, should we be taking a break halfway through every um, video meeting to, for everyone to stand up and move? Or pointing out that that line of communication with the employer is difficult right now because of the threat of layoffs or uh, productivity has changed because now we're being required to log our tasks while we're working from home, that kind of thing. Do you have any comments about that sort of change management or how to look at pro productivity during this time? Well, I, I didn't even think about taking those breaks during the video conference. I love that idea. So I think what that, your, your um, person that just typed that in, they're, they're really suggesting we need to be creative. 
So instead of thinking of how we're doing work as the old ways that we've been doing work, our whole lives have been turned upside down. And that's, I think we have to also accept that even though um, we still are trying to be productive, there is so many things that have changed. And so if we can come with creative ways to the table, first of all, you know, like the caller or the, type, the person that typed the question in, get up during a, a video conference call, change your posture, great solution. Another one that I'm really pushing with a lot of people is to talk with your employer that there, you might not be able to work a full eight hour day um, in terms of doing it continuous because you might be homeschool. Many people are homeschooling with their teachers online, with their kids. So I think we have to really be also open to be um, looking at creative ways of how people can work. Great, well, thank you so much, Dr. Miller. This is advice that is so relevant to all of us right now. Uh, I know I'm personally looking forward to having a healthier workspace at home and from seeing all the comments, uh, I know there are people who are watching who already have a healthier workspace at home. So we really thank appreciate you sharing your expertise. Um, one question that's come up a lot uh, in the chat and we had some emails coming in is, about the recording of this uh, presentation and we are going to put that online. So please check out our website in the coming days uh, for an update on that. I typed the, uh, the website address into the chat so you can copy it from there. Um, and we also mentioned a little earlier that we'll be curating some resources that you can find on the website as well. So please check out our website, follow us on social media and we'll share those with you that way. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's watching for watching today's live stream. This new Rehab Med Live series is all about our faculty and alumni coming together to uplift the whole people. And so if you have ex uh, expertise that you'd like to contribute, or if you have any ideas for future topics that you'd like us to cover, please reach out to me by email. Uh, you can just reply to the message you received with the live stream link in it. Uh, on April 22nd, two weeks from today, we'll have a presentation by physiotherapist Sunny Deal on exercises and basic stretches you can do at home without any special equipment. And I know that was a question that came up a lot in the text chat as well. So uh, please uh, stay tuned for information on that presentation as well. Uh, you can check out our website for more information, rehabilitation.ualberta.ca. Thank you again to everybody for tuning in. Thank you, Dr. Miller. And we hope to see everybody yeah. at the next one. Thank you.